Welcome everyone. Welcome to day five of Sword Squatch 2020, Cyber Squatch. Thanks a bunch for being here. This has been a heck of a lot of fun so far. Um, just a you know, quick, quick uh, daily announcements. My name is Aiden Blake. I've been a, a organizer and founder of Sword Squatch since day one. Our uh, moderators today are Shane Malone, uh, Tim Lloyd, two other Sword Squatch organizers, and Clara Elliott-Smith. Um, they'll be on soon, don't you worry. Uh, just a quick reminder about our code of conduct. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter. Be good to each other. Be excellent to one another, as Bill and Ted would say. Um, if you break our code, yeah, code of conduct at any point, we'll just be nicely removing you, and that'll be that. Um, if you have any questions during this stream, drop them into the, uh, the Q&A feature in Zoom or post it into the chat, and one of us will uh, shoot those questions over to Jess. Um, let's see if I've got anything else. Uh, that's, that's all I got. So here we are. Jess Finley, take it away. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, welcome to the Turn Halla. I'm here at my training space. Um, and as Aiden said, um, please throw those questions into the Q&A because of the way my camera and computer are set up. Like once we really get going, I'm not going to have access to literally physically see whatever you throw up there. So um, if you put it in the Q&A, he'll be able to read it out to me. Um, and I don't mind being interrupted with questions like so they can they can come in as soon as they come in. It doesn't uh, it doesn't bother me whatsoever. Um, so good morning. Good Sunday morning. I'm excited to be here at Cyber Squatch. Um, I would have been more excited to be at the real Sword Squatch and get to hug everybody, but that's in an alternate life and we'll do it again some other day. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today is what horse combat can teach us about Lee Schenauer's view of uh, combat with the one-handed sword, right? So we're going to kind of take those lessons and generalize them out. Um, and we're going to see that for the most part, it works. For the most part, it's pretty coherent. Um, and a few places, because we aren't horses, um, things are going to work different. So we'll just talk about those as, as they arrive. Um, if you would like to join me physically, please make sure that you have enough space around you that your messer or your stick is not going to hit loved ones, furniture, or animals, because um, that is really important when you're training inside your living room. Um, but with that, let's go ahead and get going. If you don't know me, hi, I'm Jess Finley, and uh, I am in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, I've lived uh, in DC and Atlanta and recently have come back to Kansas, um, which is, you know, my, my home state. Um, this is the area where my, where my family is all from. And um, I'm super pumped to be back home, uh, though I miss getting to train with all you guys a lot more frequently in person. Um, I have listed here all of the ways you can find me. Um, the most reliable is gonna be to email me. Um, but, you know, you could certainly get me through Facebook messaging system if you want. Um, but sometimes I don't see those. So just, you know, buyer beware. If you don't hear from me, send me, send me an email straight up. Um, so let's talk about horse combat. So this is me um, and my horse. She's totally not my horse. Um, the horse I get to ride. Her name is Kita. And um, I've been working on um, learning to ride and getting efficient at it since, uh, oh goodness, January of this year. Um, so not a lot of time, right? I am still very much a beginner to the process, um, but I do understand sword combat. Um, so really what I am learning is footwork, right? When I'm working with Kita. Um, because, you know, she, I'm, I'm gonna jump to this slide because she is um, my feet when I am on her, and in some ways she's my power generation, right? Because I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to be pulling from my hips to generate things because that's going to be telling her to do different things and might even make me unstable in my saddle. So rather than using my hips um, as I would on the ground when I'm on my own two feet to uh, 
power strikes or orient things, I'm going to actually use her feet to do those. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really kind of blew my mind when I first started learning about what, um, what combat on a horse looks like and, and how it might differentiate from what we do on foot is really this idea that, that the horse has two ways to turn. Um, and really, we do too. We'll get into that. Um, but uh, if, you, oh God, it's on the left of my screen, but um, you can see that we have um, an example here of a horse that would be bringing its hind end around or turning on its front feet, right? Um, and that might be a way maybe I could power a second cut or power as fair chow, as well as turning in to kind of change the angle on winds or on different wrestling techniques. And we see this though, like modern horse people would say to turn on, your, have the horse turn on its front feet is suboptimal, like it's less athletic. Um, but there are definitely depictions of it, um, particularly in the Goliath manuscript, there is a pretty clear depiction of a turn on the forefoot. So there's, there are times where for, um, for combat reasons that you might turn on the front. Likewise, on the right side of the screen, you can see the horse deciding to turn away or to turn, turn on its hind quarters, so on its back feet. And again, you can easily imagine how that could power, help power a cut or help uh, drag someone off their saddle um, once you've got into a wrestling scenario. Um, as well as a myriad of other um, applications for both of these kinds of turns um, that are well beyond the scope of this when we don't have horses here and multiple people here and, and all of that. Um, so, you know, because the point of this class is to try to help us find um, analogs for horse combat to foot combat, you know, um, I am very much reminded as a wrestler of um, kind of the two ways that you can turn in to an opponent, right? So <clears throat> if I'm looking to wrestle with somebody, right? And let's say I wanted to throw them forward over my hip. I kind of have two ways I could do that. If I was in this setup with my left foot forward and I wanted to step in front of them, I could do that, right? I can pass and then just rotate on my feet and take them down over my right hip. But if I were this way and I still wanted to take them over my right hip, I could instead come away, right? And, and do, you know, we call it a compass, but you know, to compass or triangle away to power that same exact throw over the hip. Nothing changes but my feet. Um, so I think we do have this idea of two turns or two different ways to turn to power the same thing on foot. It's just not quite the same since we don't have four feet. We've only got, we've only got two. So the other thing that's weird about horse combat that you have to think about is that it's sighted. So um, in a much more dramatic way than foot combat is. Though we're, again, we're going to see how this applies. So whenever you're looking at the medieval texts, they are going to give you a setup. And they are going to say, when you come with your right to their right, as I'm showing on the leftmost. So that means that our horses are going to be passing each other so that our right sides are going to come near each other. And the assumption is we're all right-handed, of course. So that means that our swords are gonna be coming together. This is where we're gonna have the most reach. This is where we're gonna have the most power and this is gonna be the natural place for <clears throat> us to be hitting each other with swords, winding, taking off and coming around to the back, all of that good stuff. But we could come left to left. So what happens when we come left to left is suddenly we can still strike, though we've got to worry about our horses head out in front of us, our angles are a little bit different. And because our angles are different, that means it's short, right? We can still totally reach them, um, particularly with a thrust, which is what we're going to see. Um, but 
that being said, it's still a tactical consideration that that is shorter. That being said, this empty offhand, which has been directing our horse, of course, is horse, of course, haha, <laughs> is still available to boom, jump in, and wrestle. And one of the things that they talk about um, in the text is that it's important to have dexterity with your horse driving hand, with your left hand, so that you can come to wrestling techniques whenever you need them. When we look across manuscripts, we see all different um, ways that the medieval person was handling this problem. Sometimes they appear to just drop the reins and let the horse have its head, which um, I think would be indicative of you having a well-trained horse, you being a good horseman yourself, right? And you, you having a lot of trust in your animal at that point, if you're just going to drop rein control and drop head control, right? But also, you sometimes see that they would throw their hand through the reins and then have it available to wrestle while they still have that control on their arm, right? And it certainly does speak, that, that in and of itself speaks to some maybe different things that would happen. Because of course, if I drive my hand over this way and I have my reins looped through, that's gonna tell my horse to, to also go that way, right? So if I'm trying to wrestle and grab, I'm at the same time signaling my horse, go closer to their horse. So that's interesting and, and maybe, maybe would be useful. Um, you know, I'll let you know when I get an opportunity to, to practice that sort of thing. Um, and then there are some later texts that talk about uh, that you need to have basically quick release knots that you can throw your arm through these quick release knots, but if you were to pull on the proper rein, it would come undone and make more space uh, for the horse and let it have more of its head um, if you needed to wrestle and needed to have more um, length. So exactly how that would work, I don't know. I've played with a couple knots to see, um, but again, I haven't tried it on my horse because I'm not a good enough rider yet. <clears throat> so on the right side of the screen, or at least my right side, I hope it's that way for you guys. I never know how it broadcasts out. Um, we see what happens when we're going the same direction, right? So we're now no longer facing each other. What's probably happened to provide this setup is that we've gone past each other and circled. And um, in that circle is basically <laughs> almost all of the tactics of, of horse combat, of how you get around behind them. Excuse me. Um, uh, right versus left, when I come with my right to their left, this is basically the sweet spot. This would be, if we were fighter pilots, right? Like this is where, where we're after, where we're gonna have that clean shot, right? Um, because when I'm coming up to their left side, that means their sword, their useful weapon, is as far from me as it humanly can be. Um, whereas mine is as close to them as it humanly can be. And so it would require then them to have to turn all the way around to try to do some sort of hanging defense behind their head. Um, and sometimes like with earlier stuff, you see, you see guys with the big old heater shields, right? And they'll be dropping that point behind their head. So, you know, there's lots of cool things to explore there. I know Roland Varsica is doing um, a good bit of work on, on how those heater shields might be used um, and Arnie Coates as well. So that's who I would look up if you were more interested in, in that earlier period combat. Um, I'm gonna keep us with Leech and and with just swords for today. So we're not gonna talk about lances um, or daggers on horse. Um, so then left versus right, um, again, while we'll be coming up from behind, which is always good, right? Um, it's not as optimal necessarily because we're coming up on their sword side. Um, but we can see that it's gonna give us certain tactical options from there, particularly to fall to wrestling because that left hand is gonna be available. Cool. Hey, just a question from the audience. Yeah. 
Um, Matlock Hargrove would like to know, uh, how much do we know about leg versus rain driven German writing? We don't, we don't, as far as I know, right? I haven't run across much about it. Um, we do know that it would depend on what saddle that you were in. Um, most of the saddles that I see depicted for what I'm talking about today are more nimble saddles, right? So a jousting saddle, um, your legs get pretty well locked in um, and it's a pretty straight leg. So I, uh, I suspect it would be hard to give super complex direction um, with the leg. Um, but you know, you can see on the screen I pulled up there, um, our, our dude there, he isn't even wearing any armor, just a big fuzzy hat um, and jaunty feather. Um, but he's in a pretty light saddle um, and, and does have himself up. Of course, they always are depicted with spears, or spurs, excuse me, with spurs. Um, and the, uh, I don't know if you've ever looked at uh, medieval bits, but they're, they're kind of a horror show. Um, they look like torture devices as much as control devices. Um, so, you know, exactly how much, um, oh, what would I say? Exactly how much subtle work they were doing, I think is up for debate. Um, but certainly I know modern practitioners now um, pretty much use extensive use of leg signaling, so, um, as well as neck reining. So that's kind of, I'm, I'm just leaning on their work and assuming that that is, that is the right way to go. Okay, so continuing on from, from here, if we're looking at um, the very first guard that gets talked about on horse combat, it's kind of like gonna be where we're gonna strike from. Not even kind of, it is where we're gonna be striking from. So, um, it's analogous to the fiddle bow on, on foot, which if I grab a, if I grab a buckler, right, that would be laying it across my arm out here. Sometimes it's all the way up here because you're covering your head. Sometimes it's more low. Either way, I'm laying the flat on my arm and I have my long edge and point oriented towards my opponent, whether it's high or low with my hand. Um, and so because we have that left hand forward on our reins, <clears throat> this is a super comfy position for us to begin. And I, I'm holding reins high because of the camera, so you guys are gonna forget that. Um, but from here, we can power cuts. So if you would like to take a moment and just practice that, maybe you've never worked from fiddle bow, it might be new to you, um, it's worth playing with. So my reins could be super low and my hand low. Um, you see the, the tall Hoffer dude there on the left actually kind of seems to be point up with his sword here, um, which again makes sense. I'm kind of putting my hands on the same uh, horizontal plane in agreement with the ground, right? And so from there, I can throw a cut from my right. Um, and here I'm just doing it on the ground for us out from our right, okay? We can also likewise parry um, from there up into, you can think of like an ox maybe, um, but it's just called the high guard, right? So that's right here, the overhoot, um, but he's just dropping, dropping his point, raising his hilt, um, and is out to his right side defending his head against an incoming blow. And then from there, you could thrust. Um, of course, one could potentially ride in in this position, but I don't ever see it advocated in the text. Interesting, you know, I don't know what that means, if anything, but it seems to be something that you're just gonna drop into as a parry and then come into your work from there. So, since we're kind of talking about Messer today and not Sword and Buckler, um, I kind of threw out, you could think of <clears throat> this guard as being a little bit like Vexel. Now, normally if I were 
in Vexel over on my left side, I wouldn't throw an overhaul from there, right? So that's a little bit different. Um, but this is really going to be helpful for our first play that we're going to practice. <laughs> so feel free, if you want, you can, you can take it from your arm in the horse guard, or you could practice taking it from Vexel up into this steer or Uberhut, whatever you would like to do. Hopefully I am in frame enough because I know it's showing my feet. I'm going to tweak that just a little bit for you guys. There we go. Right? So the first play that comes up is Tosh and Hal, right? Which I've seen, I think on Wicked Hour, it's been translated as uh, tacit um, strike. Uh, or I've also seen it translated as bag strike or bag cut. Um, but really it's purse, right? Um, and we see the same thing come up there in, uh, in Mr. Lakushner on the right, where you see he's cutting the opponent's purse, right? Rather ridiculous. So this gets into um, one of the main differences between horse and foot combat is that when we have our horses going and they're going right side to right side, we are going to have a tendency to always run past each other, right? There is definitely going to be some circling and some engaging and some, some subtlety to that, right? So don't overthink that. But horses in this sort of scenario don't make a hard stop and back up right? Like people on foot absolutely do quite frequently. So um, what that then sets up is that after our parries or after our cuts, we only have a very, very short window to pull off a wind or to pull off a parry or to pull off something. And then from there, our targetings are going to immediately change. Um, you know, you aren't typically going to go right, left, right, because the horses are past each other by then. Or at least the angles have changed enough that it's going to be less sure to do so. So what you start to think of is uh, the first strike that comes in, a response, a response to that, play is done. And they typically don't go much further than that. Um, so... <clears throat> With, with random exceptions. Okay, so I've got my sword out here to just have for us to work on. And what I would like to do, if you guys wanna, wanna play with this, I don't know. Um, my moderator, am I big enough that you guys can see this sword or should I unshare my screen? Uh, it's gonna be better if you can switch to the video view. Yeah, totally. I sure will. So I will stop that share. Okay, yay. All right. Yay. I was afraid I was going to break something. <laughs> oh, God. Me and technology. All right. So here we are, guys. Um, so I've got my, my sword out here on its, little, on its little holder. And it's more or less at the same height as me. It's a little low for this, but we're going to leave it. Um, so what I could practice is again, if I was coming up for the horse, what we're assuming is that there is some sort of right overhaul coming into my, into my brain pan. Um, so it's gonna be coming out this way towards me, even though I am out to the left of it and his arm isn't long enough for that to happen. We're just gonna accept that for today, okay? All right, cool. So there we are. So maybe I'm here. The blow is coming in, and so the first step of my Tasha now is to make a parry. So I'm going to long edge up, catch that point, and try to hit the face. From there, we're still moving past each other, so I'm just going to take a step. We're going to assume they parry that out, and so I'm going to attack the low opening, walking it through. Right? So on horse, that's kind of what it's going to look like, right? 
they're cutting up my face. I make a parry. They parry that. I hit them in the purse, right? But of course on foot, that doesn't quite work. Now on foot, this is here. So what does Lakushna say about this? Because he does show the Tashin how. What he says is, first up, you're gonna cut right to right, gain a parry and ob naaman to this side. From here, come up at that face, hit their hand away, hit them in the back. So that's how he gets the guy turned around and hits them in the purse, right? And so I'm not remembering all the exact footwork of Lakushna, but you can see the idea of the play. Strike in, get a parry, come here, threaten that face, get them to maybe lift their hands up into a hanging parry or to start to move their hand this way to try to stop that. So you can engage the hand, turn them around, and cut that purse, right? So again, this is very much about <coughs> a play about we're moving past each other. So you're gonna notice that for the Tosh and how, whether on horse or on foot, we're looking to get this right-right engagement, um, or right side to right side, right? Which is a, a leftover how um, when we're on foot. But our right side is against their right side, so we're on the outside of their sword, right? And so once you consider that, you can start applying that to more and more of your thoughts about messer combat. Am I straight in front of them, which for horse would be a left left? My hand is going to be engaging with their sword. Or am I on right right? And now maybe my hand can touch them, but it's not the same. This is going to stay in sword cut and come past land, which we will see see more of. Let me get my screen back up. I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, there is actually a question. Um, Excellent. Carrie is wondering uh, how you made that sold holder thingy. How I made what? The sword the holder? The sword holder thingy. Yeah. Oh, this is a stand for bike repair, bicycle repair stand. It's like 60 bucks on Amazon. I got a more expensive one because I'm a chump and I didn't need it. Don't get the expensive one. It's not worth it. Um, and we're going to thank Dave Rawlings for that because that's his idea. All right. So we're still in right versus right. What's our next lesson on horseback, right? Tashin Hao is the first one from the sword. The second lesson is swinging, right? Which means constraining. It means my opponent no longer has any options, right? So um, in, in, uh, uh, in the hunting language, they use swinging to be talking about starving, starving, not really, but cutting the, uh, cutting the food for their uh, hunting hawks way down so that the hawks become more and more and more desperate to hunt, right? So it's constraining their weight. Um, like if you're looking at like castles and stuff, um, you know, sometimes there's like kind of those murder hallways, like once, once the invading army gets in the gate, there's like this curvy murder hallway where you can kill them before they get to the second gate. That's also Sphingen, right? So it's the idea of limiting the options of the opponent to get more hits in and to make them desperate, right? Um, so on horse combat here, you, uh, you can see there on the left, we have Tallhofer depicting a guy trying to make that cool parry, right? He's trying to, he's trying to come up for that first long edge up parry. Um, but the guy riding forward should be, it's hard to see in this picture, but he should be bringing his point over and into the face of his opponent. And he could do that through winding, through hanging over, or for just getting a good overbind into that, into that parry. 
um, and driving his point. Um, and this is a lesson that we see time and time again. It comes up um, in, in Blosfekten on the Sprechfenster, right? Um, and in Zornhau, um, as well as when you're using Absetzen. Um, constraining is really, I mean, if you were to ask me what's the central piece of the art, it is this. It is constraining the opponent's options by forcing them to parry, specifically because they're about to take a sword in the eye, right? Um, and everybody, whoever they are, cares about that. They aren't likely to be willing to eat that just to try to get a leg hit or something, right? If we weren't wearing masks. So this, this point in the eye, point in the face, point in the face, driving, 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 um, is this constraining idea. Um, and there's a few different plays that they talk about on horseback. Um, but if we were to look at it <coughs> on foot, Mr. Lignitzer here um, gives us gives us constraining um, from the low guard, actually, from Bastai down here. Okay, um, and what he talks about. He also does it from Fresh Fencer and other places, right? Let me bring out Bob. Come here, Bob. Oh, Bob, why are you so heavy? All right. Woohoo! There we go. Cool. Bob. So um, if I was taking Lignitzer's advice on constraining, what he tells us to do is to start in this low guard in Bastai. Um, and with your left leg forward, and to pop your tip up and to thrust and with your thumb on top whoop, thrust with your thumb on top and this is the way i do this is the way i thrust with long sword and this is the way i thrust with kind of everything now um just because i haven't seen a reason not to for the most part um unless i need to cover a side and then that's something else right so what we're doing is we're constraining his options bob has no options <coughs> if all he sees is that point coming up at his face. Um, Lignitzer, Lignitzer, sorry, Lacushner seems to um, apply it's coming in with some sort of lunge, right? Boom, hit or I don't, he passes out or just parries a tip or something, that's fine. I could let him get away or I could drop, if he gives me a parry to my tip, I could drop my point under, make cover in Drischwechsel, and go out to my left. But the idea that we're sharing with horse combat is this constrainment. So if you want to work it for a minute, it's pretty fun. Starting with that left leg forward point down. Um, there's all different specificities you could do here, but it doesn't really matter as long as the point's mostly forward. Pop that tip, thrust, right? Maybe he comes in. And I can turn that around and hit him. I can stay high, I can stay low, or I could just throw that out until I get either Bob or the Perry I'm looking for. Um, so that's just something to think of. I know often we think of Messer as just cut, cut, cut our way in, um, but thrusting our way in is pretty central to the art. <clears throat> Excellent. Let me share my screen again. Let me share my screen. Boop. Excellent. So <clears throat> we've done our constraining with the point, and now we start to consider that left hand and how it comes and becomes engaged in this scenario. Now, um, I'm sorry that this horse the image is kind of crappy because it was in the, in the fold of the original parchment. Um, and as I'm sure you guys have seen, they, they don't like to stretch out those old books to try to get them flat. So um, the perspective is a little wonky there because of that. So that's why it looks weird. Um, it wasn't drawn that way. It's just because it's in the fold of the book. Um, but we're bringing right side to right side. And in this case, rather than coming from the parry and constraining, um, maybe we were 
maybe we just weren't ready or maybe uh, both people just thought, oh, I'm going to cut like at the same time, like always happens, right? Like, oh, there's my opening. I'm going to hit it. Oh, crap. They're cutting too. Either which way, we're both going to, we're both going to cut into each other, right? With a right overhaul. And we're going to be bringing our right sides to our right sides. <clears throat> um, and so if we were to both cut in, then as you can see with both the horsey guy and the cow guy, you're coming up under the pommel of the opponent's right hand with a turned over with a turned over left hand, right? With a reversed left hand. So your pinky side of your palm is gonna hit up into their forearm behind their pommel. You turn it to the right, and as you do so, you're going to open your point in. Um, horsey guy is showing it that he's turned himself up into that overhoot. Um, Cal is just like, screw it, I'm just going to cut him, right? <clears throat> and again, I think this has to do with um, the difference between uh, the way that people are coming past each other in horsey combat versus um, on foot combat, where Cal can turn that over and back up and make space um, to get that good cut in, whereas uh our our horse guy there on the left he's opening up and withdrawing his point way back here um because he can't really retract himself in any other way if he were to cut he would be hitting with the pommel or the cross piece into the face which they totally do on horseback um but here they're trying to get that uh point in so um if you wanted to play with this one with me um, cause I actually really enjoy it. It's so much fun. And I'll be able to show you on the dummy a little bit here. So once we're, <clears throat> I need to have it higher, right? Cause we're having this <clears throat> over how, over how situation, right? So we're on foot right now. This is, this is, uh, what we're imagining is that we are on foot. I did. I brought him too high again. Sorry, that's all right. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna get it. Because what I want you to be able to see is that. So here's my pommel. There we go. There's my pommel, right? Um, and I am looking to get up under here onto their forearm and turn that down, right? <clears throat> so. I can't quite get him oriented so that it looks like an overhaul. You guys are going to have to forgive me for that. I'm sorry. But that's not the important part. I know you guys all know how to cut uh, a true edge to a true edge. I believe in you, right? That you know how to get that. Um, so this is the important part. So this is the forearm, hand, pommel, right? Up under. And I'm going to leverage around this way, take it down and then I can cut and go mad. Let me show it from this side. Hopefully all y'all know this one because this is a good one. Um, but if you don't, I'm so excited to be the one to introduce you to it. So when I come up under, it's here. I'm gonna wrap onto that forearm. I might get all the way through. That's also totally okay if you get deep. Um, I tend to think of a closer break. That way, I'm not fighting against, I don't want to be fighting against the strong of the opponent, right? Um, necessarily. So, right here, around, open it up, turn it over, and then I can crank that elbow down as I do that and get my opening like Cal shows, right? Nice. Cool. Are there questions? Before I keep running. There are actually a couple of questions. Um, the first question that we have right now is, would it be accurate to call Zwingen provo provocation or is it a slightly different concept? I think it's, I think it's an overlapping concept. Um, I tend to think of, 
I think I tend to think of provocation um, a little bit differently, though. But I guess it would depend on how you think of it. So, so really, what you know, not to confuse it with modern terms too much that I honestly don't have the expertise to speak in in depth. Um, what I would say is that if you are using your provocation in such a way that their only option is to parry you, then yes, it's the same, right? Um, if you are using a provocation that kind of, like a cut that maybe comes through because you're trying to get them to chase you and do something else, um, then no, that would be different. Right, that would be a different idea. So hopefully that's. All right, and we've got one other. It says, um, it seems, uh, da, 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 I, I can read really. It seems like, it seems like the quote unquote loser in the exchange is cutting way too wide. And that's why, is that why one can grab under the opponent's sword arm? No, oh, that's a fantastic question. Okay, so it isn't that they're cutting necessarily wide. Um, it's actually that their hand has come close enough to um, our side that we could get it, right? Um, and on horse, because we would be thinking about right, right um, for this for this setup, like they've come here, dummy, come here. They've oh god, they've cut right and I've cut right. I can't get him to have the right angle. No, because then I'm in front of him. He can't do it. He can't be on horse. <laughs> um, but, all right. But the idea is that our hands have come here. So it isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily that they're leading with a pommel, right? With a cut coming in. Though that could be a way you could snatch it out of the air. Typically, it's from a bind, right? So we've bound and we've gotten close. And so now that we're close, I can grab you. And I can do that from really close inside my cover right here and turn that out and get that thrust. And that's the way I usually end up doing it. And that's most of the times when it's described in greater detail, like in uh, Jobs von Württemberg, they talk about it from here um, that our, our hands have come quite close together. Maybe even they've overbound over to my left, right? There's all kinds of ways we can get in into that, but it's from the bind. Okay, and one more. Um, yeah. On right to right on horsey, are we swinging right to left or left to right for this one? Um, this one uh, seems to be that even though I'm just going to make this sword like my opponent's hit, right? So even though they're over there and I'm coming on this side, that I'm cutting from my right to the left side of their head. Like I would be coming through into my own horse because we're getting this, this inside bind. Though I guess it's outside because we're out here, but you see what I'm saying, right? So we're getting true edge, true edge rather than this would put me on this side of the sword. So I don't think it's from here because then it doesn't look like the pictures of this play, right? It's gotta be over here. So I'm striking from my right to the left side of their head, just like a normal right sider's initial cut. <clears throat> All right, thank you. That's it for the questions right now. Awesome. All right, guys. We are trucking along. Oh my God, 45 minutes have already gone by. What are we gonna do? We're gonna get through it. We're gonna power. It's gonna be good. All right. Right. So <clears throat> let's consider back. In this case, we're right to right still. And I've come up with my parry up underneath into that overhoot, right? We have already seen that if our horses are taking us past each other, we can do that tosh and how and hit low. Um, but in this case, it's 
having us work on hanging our point in. This is another way of constraining, um, but from here on horse, we're just not even gonna worry about trying to take that high thrust because again, things are collapsing very fast. So once I've come up, if my thrust went through them or, or we're already too close, I am going to drop my sword through and grab their arm to wrestle, as you see the Tullhofer guy on the left. Um, what I think is really cool about that, by the way, the, the text doesn't say to do this, but you'll notice um, that he has gone through with his right arm and is grabbing his, um, the pommel of his uh, saddle with his right hand and has transferred his sword to his left hand. So I have some questions about how Tallhofer is depicting this. I'm not sure if he is trying to show this as an, as an unarmed technique, because it does also come up that way, um, that you're just making uh, like a karate block, right? You ride real close, real fast, get inside their sword, make a karate block to it and wrap around. So he could be showing that, um, or he could have dropped that point all the way through um, and then just transferred it to his left hand so he can hold his pommel tightly. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, likewise, you know, we talked about how uh, horses can turn on their back feet. We see an example of that going on right here in this image where he's gone through the arm and he has uh, asked his horse to turn towards us, the viewer, um, on its back feet. And that's gonna just yank the other guy right off the back of his horse. So, um, I particularly like this drawing because there's such clear, um, not only image of what the, what the humans are doing, uh, but what the horse is doing as well. I just wish Talhoffer had left us more text, right? He only has a line saying something about, you know, he's going to throw him. Yeah, we got that, man. Thanks. Real, real helpful there. Um, but there we are. Now, of course, if we're going to do this on foot, just sending your right arm through their left arm do -si do style isn't going to do us a lot of good because we don't have that same, um, you know, two ton of moving animals going past each other. Um, so we have to tweak it up a little bit if we're going to drop in this same sort of idea. So <laughs> let me just stop the share real quick. So if we're going to be working from what Lacushner shares, but shows, but again, mostly I grabbed him because he has a lot of good pictures, um, a lot of good pictures of these techniques. So that's why I'm choosing him. But guys, these things are, these things are everywhere. They're depicted everywhere where Messer is. Um, I think this one is in Wallerstein as well, but that has like trash pictures. So I didn't get to that one. So <laughs> again, we're gonna pretend this is a forearm and elbow sort of situation. Of, of my opponent. So if we were doing this um, for, for foot combat, I would probably set up in Vexel here with my right foot forward and that overhaul would be coming at my left side, which I would be cutting up into to make space. Let me get me in frame better. There we go, whoops. All right, so from that Vexel, right? I'm going to get this overhood, same thing, that parry that out. Then I can drop this through, bring it against the elbow, turn, and throw the opponent, right? I would probably be stepping in front of an actual human, um, but with my dummy here, that's the best I can do is kind of just turn around for you guys. So again, I'm going to be striking up into their strike. Dude, if I set this all the way off, then I can just hit him again. Cool. We're assuming that there's some sort of um, intention in this bind that they want to stay in. And so they're giving me pressure back to me. So I'm just going to get in there, turn that around, and throw. <clears throat> so like I said, where the, where the horse can throw to its 
back foot um, or turn to its back foot, bring its weight back and turn. Um, in this case, I'm gonna fully turn around um, into it. Make that cover, point through and throw. Um, this one doesn't come up in longsword really, because longswords are too damn long, right? I mean, we can make this cover and drop in, but then you're just, you're hitting them in the groin. There's no point to try to slip it through and go to that wrestling. Um, so this is one of those cool things that the messer gets to do because of its length. Um, and again, we see these sort of hang through and go options um, all over in horse. It's how we get to a lot of our, a lot of our wrestling. Um, hopefully you s are starting to see how thinking about right, right, as long as I'm coming from my left side, from my, from my point down sort of situation, it lets me start to deal um, in this same way. Even though we're on foot, even though me and this opponent are facing each other, if I can get to this side of their sword, the right, right plays become available. Um, with a little bit of tweaking, because again, we're on feet, foot. Screen share. Hello. There it goes. All right. So, what if we come left, left? Oh no, we're not left, left yet. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. We're so right, right, but we want to thrust out of the gate. We're like, yeah, we're going to thrust up. We're going to constrain just straight up out of the middle, right? We're not going to wait to uh, bind to go to our constraining. So in this case, um, what they call neighborhood on horse is a point forward guard where the sword is held next to the right leg with the point upwards um, past the opponent's face. I freaking love this horse so much. I think it looks like the nicest, kindest horse in the whole wide world. Um, look at his little face. He's so sweet. He almost looks like a bunny and I love him. Um, and then if you were thinking about it on foot, um, we have it depicted here. It's called Eber, uh, meaning boar. Um, and again, it's that, that boar's tooth, the point up sort of idea that we're gonna be thrusting from below and all of the jokes that entails. So <clears throat> there's some options that we have um, as, we, as we go to do this, depending on how they are reacting um, and whether we're cutting first or last or, or how it goes. So let's look at this inverted hand. Um, in this case, let's assume um, on the left, what we're seeing is uh, the, the horseman on the left, the horseman that's winning the exchange has um, thrust, received a blow, properly parried it, and here we are. Um, so I know you guys can't see in this image because it's so small, but if you go to Wiktenauer and have a look, you'll be able to see in this section um, that the dudes on horseback in this particular Tallhofer are using messers. Um, and in fact, in all of the short weapons in this book, it's messers. So it's messer and buckler, messer on horse, messer on foot with no buckler. Um, so uh, this turned hand idea um, certainly is important for, for foot combat. It's one of the main three parries. Um, and being, being, let me make myself big here and then we'll start talking about the, the three parries. Um, cause we've already seen one on, on horse combat, right? Um, right. So if we're, if we're thinking messer for dummies, right, we are not necessarily, um, complex fighters. We are not necessarily, um, trying to pad out our book, right, with a million and one techniques. Instead, we're just looking to be um, simple and effective, um, which is what Messer on Horses, simple and effective. So, so the ground combat 
has three main parries. We have a basic simple, right? Overhaul, right? Overhaul, overhaul, parry, point up, right? So it's just a simple parry, point up. I can have a simple parry, point down, which we're gonna see in a minute. Or I can have this turned parry, this inverted hand, where the nagel is what's protecting me. So it's a little like if you were going to do it with met or with longsword, you would do cron. Cron would be the equivalent um, to the inverted hand. Uh, though the inverted hand is cooler and gives us more options because we're we're playing our flat against their edge and we get to turn our hand into um, an advantageous position for follow-up techniques. So if I was coming from neighborhood as, as we think of it in sword or from Aber in, uh, in ground combat, from there to take an inverted parry, if there's a blow coming in, I'm gonna turn my hip and foot and hand in that line and cover that as high as I need based on how their cut's coming in. That's gonna depend on my opponent and whether they were coming from over their head or from on their shoulder. If they were throwing an Unterhau, you would do something else, right? So this is just for an Oberhau. Um, so I have that point forward. If I wanted to bring out that um, parry and work it um, kind of second intention, right? Um, I could throw out my thrust and then complete the inversion to get my parry. So this does bring up the grip uh, that we use and see all the time um, in the German system is kind of this hand, sa hand shape sort of grip. I also use this with my long sword. Um, I was just thinking if I use it with my spear, I don't really with my spear, but with, with my long sword and my messer um, and my one-handed swords, I certainly do. And so what this allows me to do I'm gripping it really hard with my back fingers. They're all against my beak here, which is super cool, is helpful. And I often will open this front finger so that I have a sense of like where my hole cross is. I find that helpful to this turn. Um, and then I can push with my thumb and turn that hand over, right? So I would be here. Oh, that's hard to hold up there. My hand would be here and turning it over there. So the blow is coming in on this side. My thumb is totally safe for being here. I'm putting my flat against their edge on its way in. So what, why would we do that? What does that give us? Um, that gets us from the inside to the outside. Um, which is really useful. So here we are, here is the follow-up. Um, in the horsey stuff, um, the left hand of the winner is still directing his horse. Um, so he doesn't bother anything with it. This gets him into potentially wrestling. This gets him into just like this cut that he's delivering here. But after the inverted hand, he's going to roll that pommel around to his own left, hook it over the top, and then pull real hard, which is going to land that blow against the opponent. Now, as always, when we're on foot, because people can move backwards quickly, um, that hook isn't necessarily guaranteed to stay if that's all you have. So Tallhofer here shows um, turning it into uh, what we call elbow to the balance, right? So he's going from the inverted hand, hooking the pommel, grabbing their elbow, turning it over, stepping in front, throwing him down, and probably hitting him in the head in the process. And I think in fact, in, this, in the next image, I didn't grab it, but I think the guy is laying face down on the ground and Tallhofer is like whacking the back of his head. Um, Super gross. Anyway, so throw him down, hit him on the back of the head. Or if you're on the horse, just hit him. Um, and depending on how things go in your foot combat, you certainly could also just hook and just hit him. It's just not as 
it's safe and guaranteed because they can just turn their hand around and under how um, turning into your turn. So getting that elbow and, and making it a wrestling is, is a much safer um, proposition. Let's see, let me pull out Bob again for a minute. Where is Bob gonna go? I think he's gonna go right here. Bob, all right, so there he is. So Bob's gonna be throwing me that overhaul, right? And maybe I parry it here. Now, certainly I could do like that one Tollhofer image showed, go from my parry, hang my point, boom, and just hit him, and then maybe make a cover and cut and get out, right? That's an option. Um, if you wanted to, um, or if you wanted to go into the throw we're talking about, I'm going to be parrying it just a little bit more up in this case. Like I'm just worried about stuff and that's why I'm not bringing my point in because I feel like this might be an unsafe setup for this opponent. So I get that. Boom. There we are. So my hook is going to go right here. So you're going to notice that I am not releasing and running my arm down their sharp sword all the way in to get this hook, right? So it's gonna be really important that you maintain, I had the flat here, flat, 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 flat. Now I'm on the backside and hooked. This is fine. Even if it's sharp, that punch down isn't gonna do a whole hell of a lot. And probably hopefully I'm wearing gloves, right? I'm riding a horse. So. Boom, there. Then I can step in front, take the elbow, and I would throw down boop, this way boop, and take that through. Or elbow and hit him in the head right there, right? Just stop that elbow and get a hit, right? All you have to worry about is this dropping down. So if you can control that so that that isn't gonna come into your space, you're good. Do we have questions? We're at a good spot before I, whoa, that was a lot of my face. Sorry, everybody. <clears throat> um, we do have uh, one, it was just, uh, would the inverted hand parry be similar to a shield howl with a long sword in terms of hand positioning? Yeah, it can be depending on how you're doing your shield howl. <laughs> the thing that's a little bit different, y'all, is that the goal is to get, is to get them clear down by your nagel with the inverted hand. So in that way, that's why I liken it more to cron rather than to a shield. But yeah, I mean, the way most people do shield, I think, I think that's going to be true, um, that it's gonna come in against that um, nagel or, or the, the short edge key on, right? On that side. So that, that can be a helpful way to think of it for sure. It's, and, 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 you know, you could maybe cut into it, um, but almost always we're told to come up from a thrusty guard into that position. It's very rare, maybe not ever, that they told us to cut into it, um, but I think you could. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, and then of course we can wind, right? We can wind our point in and uh, then work with our left hand. Um, and we saw a version of this. I'm not going to depict any more for you, um, but we saw a version of this earlier, um, turning the hand over and putting your point on on horseback. Um, of course, we can, uh, we can also on the ground and on horse, after we have turned their sword down, fall to a wrestling technique. If we were on horse, what they would tell us to do would be to punt our pommel up under their chin while we drag their hand to the left. That feels like that would be pretty effective to knock you off the back of your horse. Um, and on the ground, you see there uh, that Lakushner has turned this into basically a no-goshi, right? Like basically just a, a big old hip throw. He has stepped through um, after turning the hand. He's chucked his own sword. He's just not even going to worry about it anymore. 
um, he's going to fall completely to the wrestling um, and know that's effective. Um, and this is, this is something that I think is really important with the, um, that, that we're taught by the horse combat that we should and, and could apply um, to our messer combat on the ground. And that is, it is dangerous with weapons as short and fast as this to try to stay at blade play. It is going to be safer to flow through a parry to wrestling, flow through a parry to a second um, cut that is on your way out, right? Like hitting that purse and running out, hitting a low target and running out, right? So there isn't a lot of, um, you know, maybe for instance in longsword we see uh, winding to the four openings or cutting to the four openings um, in sequence. And, and while Lacushner does admittedly include all of that, um, even there he seems to be hedging his bets, right? Um, so it is, it is much more common um, in everybody but Lacushner, every messer technique or, 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 or treatise but Lacushner to come in, do the thing, get a throw, run. Come in, get a thing, get a hit, run. That's it, right? <laughs> Don't try to think any deeper than that. Um, so I mentioned that, that other parry, um, and we are now riding to the left side. So that's, that's where this one becomes very useful. We've had two to the right side. The, the simple parry point up, or it's, yeah, or simple parry point in, either way, um, and the inverted parry. Um, but now we're going to come in to this other side. So we're going to be bowing. Um, and I'm sorry, I couldn't get you a horse picture of this. I couldn't find a picture, um, but I have you there the text of the horse. So um, when you ride to his left side, you're going to place your arm on the sword, in, or, or your sword on the arm in the guard, right? So this is that fiddle bow position. You're going to make your parry up above with the long edge. You can see that Tallhofer is showing how the fiddle bow works with the messer when you don't have a buckler, right? When you have a buckler, your, your defense is already out there, and so you can throw your sword up. In this case, you're throwing your sword up with your defense and coming into that same position with the left hand now being offensive. Right, so it's an inversion of the uses of the things, um, but through the same position, which is pretty cool. So after that, you wrap up his arm and throw a free overhaul to his head, meaning a overhaul that is not trying to constrain anything, right? It's just free, you're just gonna hit him. You're not doing anything special with the point. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and it's, as you can see, identical on foot, um, even though this text I took from uh, the anonymous gloss of horse combat in Danzig, Tallhoffer's foot, Messer, depicts this exactly. And that poor dude putting up his arm, right, and getting his arm hacked halfway off, blah, I guess better than the face, but still. Um, so there we are, um, and let me show that bowing real quick. I'm guessing at this point, this is going to feel pretty straightforward, right, compared to the other stuff. Um, again, I'm going to be getting that overhaul coming in, coming in to me. Um, because I'm not going to be starting here on foot, I'm going to put my right foot forward and I'm going to start in Vexel. I'm going to give this invitation, right, to my upper left opening. And if they cut in, I can make my cover, come in inside this wrap, and hit. Um, and so what this bowing allows us to do is really creep up close, undercover, like literally undercover, um, which is cool and fun. Um, but so this bowing is really important. Of course, you could, if you wanted, um, on foot, avoid the wrestling entirely. Just set up with your opposite leg forward. You could go left leg forward, right? Bow, maybe bow with a movement into it, 
and then you can step out with a triangle and cut the other side of the head. Obviously, this is something we couldn't do on a horse because our horses can't change sides necessarily. Um, though again, we're thinking left, left. So maybe it wouldn't be a change of sides. I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of reasons we couldn't do this on a horse. Mostly we're going too fast. So cool. So you could set up left leg, sort across it here, cover in the bow, step out, triangle, get away, right? Or if you really are feeling confident about your wrestling situation, you can step into the bow, wrap, and then take your free cut. Questions on that one? I'm getting there, hold on. Um, we did have one question and it said, um, uh, I tuned in late, so feel free to skip this if it's been covered. But is there some reason why people don't just hit the opponent's horse and then attack while they're trying to control the horse? And how does dealing with the threat of a weapon as, as short as a messer change that tactic? Yeah, um, certainly you could. And we do see attacks against the horse. Um, typically, they are against the reins. Typically, you are um, reaching, rather than maybe reaching to wrestle, reaching to grab the arm, you're just going to grab the reins of their horse and pull them off to the side. Um, and sometimes it's, it calls this sort of thing um, like, like you're throwing the horse, right? Especially from foot, if you're doing it from foot. Um, but so that's kind of that scenario where we use that is we're going to reach over and grab the reins um, while we still have our sword to deal with the human. Um, and really my thought is like hitting the horse is a very unpredictable thing to do. You don't know if the horse is going to throw itself into you and your horse. You don't know if the horse is going to drop beneath you. You don't know if the horse is going to rear up and hit you. You don't know if the horse is going to buck. You don't, you're right. So, um, you know, my take on Lieschenauer's art, particularly with the focus on Zwingen, on constraining, is that he is always looking for you to be able to predict what's going on and that that's safe fencing. Um, so that would be my, my personal, like, basic reason is that it would be an unpredictable response and you never want that. You always want to know what's going on. All right. And the next question is, does the fact that the horses will continue to move forward lead to wrestling situations? By comparison, two fighters on foot can stop more easily, but if the horses keep pushing the humans together, does that make wrestling arm wrestling slash arm retention, et cetera, better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it makes it more likely. Um, they, there certainly is more cut wrestle or parry wrestle as, as plays than there are cut cut or cut thrust or cut wind or cut their spexel or cut, right? So on foot, I think because we, we can't predict on on there being some sort of measure collapse. Now, certainly, certainly horses could come close and then veer off like this, right? You don't always have to like go past, um, but there is a tendency to try to get here. And so there is a tendency to go past and that does lead to the wrestling um, rather than certainly again, Horses could come together and you could go, ah, but I think maybe you can already see what could be dangerous about that is if I turn here, I'm basically putting my back available to the opponent, right? Um, so because of that, there, there tends to be a, like spiraling around each other. Um, and, and to be honest, what I've found is for, particularly for the windings, um, if you're going to string winding together um, with slices and cuts and stuff, that um, even on foot, thinking of 
um, I don't know, kind of a yin yang moment, right? Like we kind of go halfway around each other and then we get free. Um, though we certainly could come in and out, that doesn't lead to the plays that are in the text. Um, so whether that's because, um, like we were discussing social violence last night and the performance of violence, whether that's because performing um, a manly fight looked like horse combat to them, and so they trained in this circling around manner more than an in out manner. I don't know. I kind of I like that idea. I'm enamored of it. Uh, there's no way I could ever prove it, um, but uh, my my gut is that that is what uh, is the major sea change between um, medieval fencing and Renaissance fencing um, is that is that once we become more more line oriented, it starts then to look more like a joust with swords, right? Which doesn't have a circle; it it has a straight past or a straight through and back, right? So hopefully that answers that question. I went a little. That's it for right now. All right, awesome. <laughs> Uh, there we go. We are almost through, guys, because I know we're coming up on time. All right. So left, left. Here's our final, our final guard that we are going to consider, which is um, basically Sprush Fencer. It doesn't get named um, in the horse combat. Um, <coughs> sorry about that noise. Jesus. Both that and me. So um, what, what this is talking about here is, um, is long point, right, posta longa, um, but specifically using it um, as a way to enter into that thrusting game, into that constraining game. Um, when we are approaching left versus left on horse, obviously our neighborhood on our right hip is not going to do us any good because they're on the other side. So we have to bring our point into presence, and we are going to do that by putting the pommel of our sword um, onto the, well, onto the pommel of our saddle, right? Um, on foot, we see uh, Mr. Lacushner here, um, just in his post longa. Um, so, or, or his long point, or his fresh fencer, whatever you want to call it, depending on how you work with swords on foot. Um, and again, this is, he could be dropping in here from his, from his overhoot or his steer. He could be dropping in here from his aber, from his bastai. Um, but he's, he's bringing that point in. Um, and in this case, I think he's doing a Durchwachsel underneath to continue the threat um, or a, a circular disengage beneath the opponent's parry and resuming his, his thrusting intention. I think that's where I pulled that one from. I can't see my notes right now because of screen sharing, but, but I'm pretty sure that that's what that is. Um, so here, let's have a look. There isn't much to practice here on foot, because again, I'm sure you guys all know this guard um, and probably, probably its uses, but once we're up here, this is an Australian saddle, um, Australian style saddle, um, but I thought it would be cool to show you guys um, because it actually does have a pretty high pommel, unlike um, a lot of modern, um, modern saddles. So this is a modern saddle I picked up used cheap on, um, on eBay of all things. So there we are. Um, so what he is suggesting we do, this is my horse's head coming out here is that I'm going to take my sword, my nagel is on the outside, and I'm going to point it to my left to direct it at my opponent. And I may be here, but I doubt it, right? I'm probably not holding my reins here. So very frequently in Tallhofer, you see that they're, they're holding their reins not in center the way I picture, I'm not exactly sure how they're doing this or how they're reining their horses, um, but 
you often see their hand is way, way, way down here on this side, like their knuckles are on the horse's neck and they're holding the rein down there with this elbow out like this. And this gives me this above my reins and available. Again, I, I'm too new to riding to tell you guys exactly how that's useful. I'm just telling you what I'm observing and how that interacts with the, with the sword part of this. So I don't wanna hit my horse. I'm coming left to left and I wanna be able to get here. You guys see this already sets me up for my turned hand. If they came really, really hard and did run into me, obviously having a habit of bringing this to, um, to my pommel of my saddle is going to be helpful um, because it's more or less like couching it, right? That I could couch a, a longer weapon up here. This is going to be my couching. And, you know, for those of you who have done armored combat, you know that we can couch, couch, such as it were, but by putting our pommel in our hip and driving this in as much as we could do it here. So this is that low couch um, on horseback. Um, you know, and we never see a sword up here. Um, and I guess it's, my guess would be is that it tends to be a shorted hilt, shorter hilted sword than our long swords, which we can tuck up under there if we needed to. Um, so that's, that's my suspicion on that. Anyone have thoughts on that? Questions, comments? We do have a couple more questions coming in. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Does the application of pony stuff to Messer on foot require the assumption of an environment with plenty of space as opposed to a crowded bar or other constrained space? That is a good question that I haven't considered until this moment. So let me think about it for a second. Okay. Um, no, I don't think so. And here's why. Because while pony stuff obviously takes like a huge amount of space um, to pull off, I think my instinct is, is that the real actual stuff happens pretty close, right? Um, it's when the opponents have gotten close enough for something to happen. So the relevant pieces seem to me to still be relevant. And again, just this very simple tactical paradigm, like cut, point in the face, cut, wrestle, right? Parry, wrestle, parry, point in the face. Like that's it, you know? Um, it's just all these different ways we could get there, um, whether we're on this side or this side and, and understanding whether you're right, right or left, left, so that you know already like what, um, what wrestling techniques are gonna be available to you or not. All right, and the next question is about your horse simulator there. Is that, yeah. um, uh, uh, is that something that's commercially available or how would one go about uh, acquiring such a thing? I built that. <laughs> <You're awesome. laughs> so um, I, I, I kind of obsessively went through the internet looking for vintage pommel horses before they became, like for, for, for gymnastics, right? So vintage pommel horses before they became standardized to what they are now with the two rings, which are really just meant to represent the front and back of a saddle anyways, right? Like that's, that's what that's from. So um, I found an old vintage one um, from like the 20s that was in this triangle shape. Um, so I just built it. It's very simple um, construction. Do, 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 do. So it's just piece of uh, plywood and then framing around on the sides. Um, and then each piece stacks on the other piece, just like that. So that um, when I'm working here by myself and working on getting better at hopping up into this and vaulting and like eventually I'm gonna totally just leap onto, uh, in, onto Keita's back and she's gonna let me and she's not gonna panic and run away. It'll be a while. Um, so I can practice that on here with this nice and high. Um, or if I drop off the bottom piece, then 
I or my student can sit here and we can walk past each other and be at the right height um, as though we were on horses. So anyways, it's, pretty, it's a pretty simple build. Um, I am definitely not a skilled woodworker, so. We have um, one more that kind of uh, goes to the height of, of your horse simulator and stuff like that. Um, and it says, uh, how do you condition folks for getting used to being thrown from a horse? Simply start with a horse simulator that is lower to the ground with lots of pads. Any particular concerns or ways to mitigate safety issues? And finally, what could, uh, could we get some notes on your, well, we just did that, the construction of the simulator, so. Yeah. Um, I can put together some more notes on that, guys, and um, throw it up on my Facebook or send it to Squatch or both, right? Um, and we'll get it out to you guys um, on, on what dimensions I used and how I built it. Um, but again, it was, it was an afternoon build. It was, it was really simple um, with, with minimal tools. Um, falling. Literally just do your normal falls, right? Do all of your falling practice that you should be doing if you're fencing anybody anytime, right? Um, also, just by the way, being a, a human, knowing how to fall, um, especially as we all get older, and, and I know some of you are like babies, but you will eventually get older. Uh, so, so being comfortable with um, knowing how to take a fall and that you have absolutely no urge to put hands out um, is number one, being able to uh, tuck and roll is super important. Um, and then it just, yes, happens higher and higher and higher. Um, judo it would be my recommendation um, for this. Maybe I can find some videos and send them out to you guys. Um, but there are, are a lot of practices of um, high falls in judo or, or high self falls, throwing oneself, right? Um, forward into a somersault, um, backwards into a roll, and that's really what you're going to need. Um, I have only come off my horse once so far, and it was because my horse tripped and took a forward roll himself, and so I got projected up off the horse and also projected myself because I knew the horse went down and knew he was going to be rolling. Um, and so I threw myself into the hardest forward roll I could as well. Um, and, uh, and it was fine. Like it was, it was, it was a forward roll, right? Faster than I had ever been thrown into a forward roll. <laughs> Cause I was on a horse at a canter and, and he slipped and fell. Um, so thankfully he was fine. I was fine. Everybody was fine. Nobody got heads hit. Nothing literally tuck and roll. So that's my, that's my recommendation um, is that you want everyone, no matter what, if you're fencing, to get to a point where you do not tense when you get thrown, you go um, controlled. Yep. All right. Thank you. That's everything right now. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So let me get that screen share back and we will deal with the horrid noise one more time. Oh good, it didn't catch. It didn't catch that time, thank God. All right, um, so we also have winding and upsetsin, right? Um, and it's interesting that this is what we do from that point forward guard, um, whether, Ah, sorry. Um, this is what we do from the point forward guard because we are going to be threatening and extending that thrust to our left side. So we have that wind to the left, setting aside any incoming blow that they are sending in. So depending on how it comes, if you are thrusting and they are cutting into your sword, it's going to be a wind of the edge against their sword in the bind the whole way, right? Whereas if they are trying to like uberlaufen you and cut over your low thrust, which is a reasonable tactic, then it's going to turn into an absetsin where that same wind happens before the bind occurs. Um, but as far as Leishenauer is concerned, 
Those are both wines of the edge, um, and they are both easy um, and important things to bring <laughs> to bring into your fight. And um, in fact, the 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 glossary of von Danzig says that Vinden and Absetzen are the best techniques of the sword to use on horse. Full stop. So <clears throat> I think despite there being all of these cut options in the beginning of the text, it's like, again, just like the organization of the long sword on foot, as we come to the winding, they're like, yeah, that's the stuff. That's the really good stuff. That's the real fighting stuff. Um, and so we have that here. Um, and we see this uh, all the time in, in, uh, in Longsword and in Messer on Foot. Um, and so let's just look real quick in case somebody maybe studies Fiori or something and is not familiar with what Absetzen might be or what that might look like on foot. If this, uh, if this sword is being brought in to me, if I was on foot, I probably wouldn't be starting in long point, of course, like I can here, but I may be. Who knows? Who knows? But either way, so once I get this engagement, I'm going to be looking here to go all the way over. So I'm not coming into my inverted, into my inverted parry. I'm not coming into my inverted parry and looking for this cross. Um, in this case, once I get this engagement, I'm looking for my short edge to be up in there. And then I can drive <clears throat> against their weak and drive that forwards. So here and in. And it's just a little bit further than the turn you've already been doing with the inverted parry. So it should feel accessible to you if you were able to get that inverted parry to work. And then once we're here, we can come into all sorts of stuff because of course they could set us out. If we're on foot, we could wind a second time, get inside here. Our nagel's gonna protect us once we get wound over so they can't just come right back. Um, so we can wind up underneath and get them on the other side or, right, we can disengage and come around, all sorts of stuff. All the stuff that you know from fencing. We're just doing it from that high guard on the left. Um, if you're coming, uh, yeah, in this case, this was a left-left scenario, right, where we engaged and wound up left. Um, he is specific that the short edge on the left, and if we come right-right, and maybe I was set up in my neighborhood to get my thrust there, if I wanted to wind, I would wind that long edge up and in and get that thrust. So it's just doing it um, from the knock rather than earlier, right? We were coming straight up into that kind of position. Just slightly different tactics. Basically the same thing though. All right, cool. All right, so just a quick talk about the last three techniques um, and we're going to go a little bit quickly because I want to leave some, some space for questions. Um, and I know we're getting close to time. So <clears throat> as we're doing this and thinking about it, um, there are three wrestling techniques. I'm not going to be able to show them to you, so I'm just going to talk to you about these last three slides real quick. Um, this is the Sun Zeigen, um, which means Sun Pointer, but, but if you were to, to be more artistic, with your translation, you would say to make them follow the path of the sun. Um, and so this is a technique for um, on horse, you're gonna be unarmed against an armed opponent. In this particular drawing, the dude pulled his dagger for whatever reason, um, but we often see this against sword. Um, so you're gonna, you're gonna come up um, with your right to their right. You're gonna get some sort of parry with your right hand. You're going to grab their left arm around behind them and then drive that right hand against their face, making them look at the sun 
and taking them over off the back of their horse. Here you see Lignitzer on foot doing what he calls the same thing. Again, you've got to get to that outside bind. So however you get there, uh, but once you do, you're going to grab the arm. And in his case, you're going to drive the messer against the face. Um, Faulkner also incidentally shows this uh, with a longsword done with the tweaking that a longsword requires. The shaft griff, um, which is the sheep grip, um, probably is what that means, um, doesn't show up on foot um, because, again, not having the animals crossing each other makes it less useful. Um, but here, again, we see some really cool stuff on the horse. I just want to direct your attention to that. Um, this, is, this is, in effect, somebody grabs you around your body to try to haul you off your horse. You're going to grab that arm, throw your own right arm over it, grab your pommel, and drag them off. So we see he has, uh, the man doing the throw has slipped his arm inside his reins like we talked about earlier. Um, when he goes to grab that hand, he doesn't just drop the reins or, to, or he doesn't haul the reins up when he grabs the hand. Um, and, and then he's going over the top. And his act of, of drawing the reins back, the little bit that it does, again, is turning the horse towards us. Um, though this horse is a lot less friendly and much more pissed off about the situation. Um, the unnamed rustling which is this third one here. Um, so there are no depictions of it on horse, um, but what it is is a chicken wing, right? This is your basic, um, you know, policeman takedown, more or less. Um, Lukushner here says that uh, once you have done it and you've, you know, it's kind of complex how you get into the chicken wing by sitting out and, and sitting down into it, but that once you get there, you can just play games with your friends. And there's no way he can get out. There's nothing he can do. He's forever trapped. Um, on horse, they talk about it for taking someone captive. So you've, you've wrapped, them, wrapped them up in a chicken wing. Um, and this is, as you, can, as you can imagine, if you know how the chicken wing works, you kind of have to be facing the same direction. So in fact, that's, that's one of those techniques that we're going to do. Um, when our horses, somebody's circled around and our horses are traveling in the same direction rather than oppositionally. Um, the final thought, um, if you do nothing else with the horse stuff, if you are a practitioner of Lichtenauer and you study his longsword, have yourself a look at the uh, text and gloss of the Voronok that is in the horse. He says that um, when you're on horse, you should grab him first, uh, and that if you do this with enough nimbleness or quickness, he won't be able to counter you. However, if you are grabbed, then you should use all of your skill to make sure that you can counter anything that they bring. So quickness in the vor is countered by skill in the knock, and either of these will deceive and diminish someone who's just trying to use strength. So that's the advice about Voronok. And while it's talking about gripping, he does specify, use this with any weapon that you also use. So super important. Um, and I love that idea of like, this is a lesson for when your horse has carried you through so that you haven't been able to do anything. How often do we run into that in sparring or tournament or whatever, that you're like, man, I've gotten hit the past three times I've come in and I'm just frustrated. Nah, remain calm. Choose a side, go with that side, do the best thing you can come up with. Um, and just as a, as a thank you to Kaya and Charles for the great chat last night, I thought I would show you one last way to use that unnamed wrestling that you should never ever tell anybody. That's why it's unnamed, because we need to keep it super secret so, so nobody ever knows you're gonna chicken wing them, pick them up and put them in a sack that your buddies brought. Um, so with that, that's the end of my class. I'm sorry I ran a little long, um, but I hope you guys had fun. Um, and I'm here for questions. Um, it is yeah. impossible for you to run too long, let me just say. <laughs> Take as much time as you need. Um, we've actually, the next session starts at one, so really we've got almost an hour that people oh, can cool. ask questions or 
Uh, chat went absolutely ballistic at this slide, by the way. <laughs> Uh, As it should Kai have. Is, Kai is very appreciative of this slide, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, if you've got questions, drop them in the Q&A, drop them in the chat. Um, floor is pretty much open. Yeah. Chat says, bag him rightly. <laughs> Yeet him into a bag. Yep. Lots we, of the typical, you're awesome, thank you, awesome presentation, oh. thank you, you know, that, that, sort of, that sort of thing. We do have uh, a couple questions starting to come in. Cool. Um, what's the best way to study horsey HEMA without horses? The same way you studied armor HEMA without armor. You do your best with what you have, you read the techniques, you practice the techniques, as best as you can understand them, recognizing there is a piece you will be missing. But if you can memorize and understand, at least on a base level, the, the, the places you're going to be moving through, where, um, like where right right binds are and what they feel like, where left left binds are and what they feel like, what winding feels like, um, as long as you just let yourself move past each other a little bit, right? Um, and leave a little bit more measure between each other. Um, it's, it's going to launch your understanding of everything else. Because um, even if you're like, you know what, there's probably no chance I'll ever get to get on a horse that's cool with me swinging a sword past its head and also apparent, like, like, Kita doesn't care about a sword at all, um, but she really cares a lot about other people and other horses being anywhere near her, right? So, like, there are all these other things to consider um, with horse combat. Um, like, horses really hate being next to each other. Um, so, anyways, unless they're buddies. But, uh, but yeah, so, so, you know, that's what you do, right? Um, memorize the plays, understand as much as you can possibly understand about them, which is going to be a shockingly large amount. And then once you get on a horse, all you have to learn is the horse stuff. Once you get armor, all you have to learn is the armor stuff, which allows you to have a very clear focus on what you're learning when you're learning it, right? Rather than, oh my God, I have this new armor on and now I'm trying to use and learn a new technique that I've never seen before in my life. That's really hard because everything is so new. Um, if you can get experience in the stuff you can, then the new stuff is just adding another layer, another flavor of it. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Regarding the pommel horses, uh, let's see. Do you think it'd be a good idea to put wheels on it? We're planning on building two for our club and are interested in designs at this point. Yeah, totally. Um, I might end up putting, getting some casters that I could pop in or pop out, um, depending on what I'm doing and what I need. I certainly have seen um, horse simulators with casters that are, um, some of them are useful and some of them are, are not, <laughs> right? Because um, once you, especially if you make it horse height, um, it isn't gonna be a, like a ton, so, um, what ends up happening is they get super top heavy and wobbly. So I think if you're going to do that, you might, I mean, mine, as you can see, has a pretty wide base compared to the top. Um, so I was thinking it might be okay to put casters on and wheel around and it wouldn't fall over. But I've certainly seen and been on horse simulators with wheels that like, ah, the moment you start to turn, they topple and fall. So just, you know, in your design, account for that. Okay, and lastly right now, can you provide a list of books, editions, translations that you've used or like to use? Yeah, totally. Um, so my base go-to is Ringek, Danzig, and Lev, which for the horse combat guys is basically identical, so pick one, um, and any one of those books would be fine. 
Um, so for Danzig, my preferred is um, Christian Tobler's translation that's in, in St. George's name, is the name of his book. Um, and that's available through Freelance Academy Press if you want to give him the most money or obviously other booksellers um, have, have it at a discount. Um, and that's a, that's a really good resource. Um, if you were looking for Lev, let me grab that real quick. It's Dear Hagedorn's, um, Dear Hagedorn's copy of Lev, and it looks like this, which is, I grabbed it because it's such a distinctive cover. If you find um, a translation of, of You'd Love, you'll be like, oh, that makes sense. Um, it's, I know it's the one because it's yellow and blue. Um, so this is really good, has that stuff in it. Um, and again, uh, is, is basically all the same. Wait a minute, now I'm going to have to question myself. Oh yeah, there it is. It's just at the back of the book. Um, but yeah, you'd left um, for that. Um, and then as far as pictures, um, the easiest to go to is that, um, that one I mentioned before, Goliath, um, which if you go to Wichtenauer and like look in the treatises page and search for Goliath, it'll pull it up. I can't remember the manuscript number off the top of my head. Um, and what that is, is an illustration of this same text I just sent you. So you can get a good translation from either Tobler or Hagedorn and then go to Wichtenauer and look at the horse stuff and go, oh, I see, because they're, the pictures are labeled, right? Um, I was giving you pictures from Tallhofer for the most part, um, but that's not as easy to find a one-for-one -one, um, because it isn't labeled in the same way as the gloss. All right, that's it for the, uh, for the questions right now. Awesome! Yeah, and I guess that's actually a good place to, to wrap it up. We'll give everybody a nice break before the next session and not too much, take up too much of your time. Thanks a bunch, Jess. That was awesome. And thank you, Clara and Shane and Tim for moderating. Um, yes. Once again, the, the next session coming up is going to be, I believe it's Longsword Biomechanics. I had it just for me. Yep, Longsword Biomechanics with Brittany Reeves. And then we've got another session, uh, solo practice with Andrew at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Um, again, thanks to everybody for making it. If you like what you see, drop us, uh, drop us some change at uh, PayPal. Uh, there's going to be a link in the Facebook post and uh, probably in the, uh, the Zoom chat. Uh, we also have a, a new store open where you can get T-shirts and mugs and like yoga mats and gym bags and stuff. Um, it's, it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. It's got this year's uh, design uh, in text and with a uh, uh, crazy floaty head, which is great um, by, our, by our local artist. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got. Thanks a bunch for joining everybody and we will see you all soon. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Now I just have to find the, I'm also going to give people a minute to click on these sweet links. Yeah. Buy merch, everybody. Buy merch. Buy our merch, please. It's good merch. It is good merch. I don't, I, I don't know what I'm going to, well, let me say, I don't know where I'm going to stop buying on the merch. That's really the question. I need to just basically weed stuff out of my cart at this point. My cart is full of stuff and I'm trying to like, <laughs> I know I can't spend this much. Can't. I can't yeah. spend this much. Yeah, heard. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. You know, there's just, there's so much in here. Wow. Um, let me just read some of this stuff out. Jack says, yeah. thanks. Fascinating stuff. Amanda Trail, thanks, Jess. Good to hear your lecture. Clara, this was great. Jess, thanks. Actually, Clara could just, just Clara can go on mute. She's, she's a host. Um, Robin, thank you. Matthew, thank you so much. Michael, fantastic talk. Yeah, fantastic talk. You put so much prep into this. Thank you. Alex, awesome stuff. Paul Schiebel, I always say that wrong. I'm sorry, Paul. Thank you. Kaya says, thank you, Jess. You are wonderful. Uh, Tibby says, thank you, Jess and Aiden and moderators and everyone who put this together. You're welcome. Uh, 
Kristen is trying to figure out how big of a duffel bag to get, and we haven't seen these in person. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I'm guessing that the large duffel bag will hold a fencing helmet. Medium, maybe, but might be a tight fit. To, like, I, I literally got out a tape measure and just sort of, like, held it out. I was like, would that fit a, would that fit a helmet? And the 12 inch by 23 inch bag, I think definitely will, but you know, you know, um, where were we? Dylan, same, same card has to get smaller somehow. Carrie, such a great class. Paul, goddammit, Aiden. Uh, Kristen, really awesome stuff. Excellent, excellent. Thank you guys. All right, I think that is, that is perfect. I'm gonna cut the recording here. Thank you so much, Jess, again. Have a good one, everybody, and we will see you soon. Bye, all y'all.